Hey everyone, welcome back to Regency Love. Oh my gosh, it has been so long. It says that the last time I played was the 2nd of November. And as I'm filming this today, it is the 29th of November. So, it has been quite some time. So, let's go ahead and resume. <coughs> Alright, let's see. Where did I leave off? Okay, my character traits are good. Whoa, I'm doing so super good. Okay, so... Trying to remember what happened. Oh, so our, our boyfriend has a really, really mean, nasty, terrible uh, friend, best friend, who is like against us entirely, like hates, hates our guts. Um, and something else, something about his family, something about his family, but I forget what that was. So we'll find out once we read in the park with the cat. We'll finish reading in the park with the cat first, and then we'll find out about our boyfriend's family. You are glad to have finally reached the park and cannot wait to get started with your book. For such a sunny day, the park is rather empty. You suspect everyone might be at the, vi at the visiting markets for the day. This suits you perfectly well as you require peace and quiet to fully appreciate your book. As you make yourself comfortable in a nice patch of grass, you notice that you are not entirely alone. Fortunately, your company is not at all intrusive. It is indeed Lord Fat Cat. Lord Fat Cat nods at you, then tips his furry head at your book. Let's see. As I am here to read, you may keep me company if you wish. Lord Fat Cat would very much like that, but he would like it even better if you read aloud. You should you start with the first page and wonder how you should approach this task. Read with plenty of drama and theatrics where necessary. Lord Fat Cat is practically rolling around in, in glee. Yes, yes, you have absolutely reached the spot. Oh, that's so cute. You continue to read aloud and occasionally hear the contented purring from Lord Fat Cat. It seems he is quite fond of Mr. Milton's Paradise Lost. Oh, that's so great. Oh my gosh, I love that. Give me all the points. All right, so man, I'm doing so good this round. Okay, here's our boyfriend. Here he is. Okay. All right. You have just settled your latest accounts at Mr. Murray's shop when you spot Mr. Graham, who has been trying to catch your attention. Miss Sharp, you seemed to be so lost in thought. I was almost resigned to escaping your notice entirely. Huh. Goodness gracious, you could never escape our notice. Oh no, I'm out of water. How am I going to get through? <laughs> wow. I do apologize, Mr. Graham. It was a simple error, and I hope I have not in unintentionally offended you. Okay, you were quite forgiven, Miss Sharp. Might I ask if you are finished with your errands or if you still have a few more to run? I would gladly accompany you if you wish it. I'm done for the day. Oh, yes. I have no immediate business left, but I wouldn't mind taking a stroll with you across town if you were so inclined. Yes, of course, it would be a pleasure indeed. Before either of you can say another word, you notice the pleasant chatter around you has ceased. Soon you realize that a certain newcomer has captured everyone's attention. Oh no, I remember this. I remember this. Okay. It is none other than Miss Peregrine, who has just stepped out of Mr. Mortimer's haberdashery across the street. Although she's not a particularly tall lady, she holds herself with much dignity and poise. Her dress and co coat boat. Her dress and coat both boast the most exquisite workmanship, though they are also still suitable for day wear. Even from the distance, you can see the quality of her soft leather gloves, which she puts on with much grace. But without a doubt, the star of her ensemble is her glorious bonnet, which contains an assortment of flowers and feathers that are carefully arranged to perfection. You realize that, though you have spoken about Miss Bergwin on occasion, this is the first time you have seen her in such proximity. I feel this is a betrayal to Mary and Phoebe, but I do not agree with them about Miss Peregrine's tastes, though perhaps that says more about my own style or lack thereof. I am very fond of your style, Miss Sharp, and would not have it otherwise. I must say, I am not at all fond of the hat. It seems to resemble a forest. 
Oh, yes, I do see the likeness. Perhaps that is one of the latest fashion trends. <laughs> it would appear so. Perhaps it would be best if we leave Miss Peregrine to her business. I confess I am not at all inclined to continue observing her. I'm finding your behavior most curious. Are you perhaps harboring some hidden intentions, Mr. Graham? Not at all. Mr. Graham is about to speak again when you see Mr. Stephen's youngest son trip as he leaves his father's bakery and accidentally bump into Miss Peregrine. The boy is no older than seven or eight, and he begins to apologize. However, when Miss Peregrine looks down at her dress now covered in flour, her entire demeanor takes such a marked turn that you can hardly believe your eyes. Her posture, which has been so calm and collected, suddenly stiffens, and with it her shoulders become hunched, and the curve of her neck strained with anger. She begins to berate the poor boy for his mistake, and though you had imagined her voice to be quiet and melodious, you find no such sounds in her current tone. Indeed, her fury has rendered her voice unpleasantly thin and nasal. Her words surprise you, for no proper lady would make such utterances. The boy starts to cry, but Miss Peregrine pays him no heed and continues to screech at him. You suspect she would have continued in such a manner if had uh, Mr. Stevens not rushed out of his bakery. After a few more exchanges, during which Mr. Stevens alternates between apologizing on his son's behalf and praising Miss Peregrine's magnanimous nature, the lady allows herself to be placated, albeit begrudgingly. Oh my gosh, this is horrible. With some final words in a much more sensible tone, Miss Peregrine straightens her back and enters the carriage that awaits her. Only when the carriage has left the main street does the conversation among Starlington's residents presume once more, no doubt centered on the spectacle you have all witnessed. You turn to your companion, who is shaking his head sadly. That boy must be quite distressed. I think I shall pay Mr. Stevens' bakery a visit later today and see if I can cheer him up. Oh, Mr. Graham, that would be so very kind of you. That poor boy is known to be a little clumsy. He didn't deserve such treatment. Come, let us find a more pleasant topic, Miss Sharp, such as that of your latest project, perhaps? I do wish to know more about your needlework. You and Mr. Graham stroll down the streets as the sun shines warmly on you both. Okay. So she's not a nice person. <clears throat> Oops, I didn't read that. I think I did that last time, too. No. Okay, turn in the park. It has been such a beautiful day, you decide to spend your afternoon in the park. Your fellow townspeople seem to have been struck with the same idea, and you see many familiar faces. You have brought with you something to do, but for now you are content to sit on your bench and watch the people pass by. You are particularly intrigued by a game some children are playing. Engrossed in your observations, you do not notice a certain figure has approached you. It is only when he makes a bow that you realize you have company. It is Mr. Graham, and he is wearing quite a smile on his face. Miss Sharp, I hope I have not disturbed you. You seem to be preoccupied with your thoughts, but you were also looking so lovely that I, I did not want to pass by without wishing you a good day. So sweet. Blush. And now you have grown even lovelier, Miss Sharp. Oh, stop. If you don't mind me asking, what brings you out here this afternoon? Are you simply taking in the sun, or do you have another purpose? Uh, I did bring with me some needlework to help pass the time. It's not much, but I do enjoy the task of creating something with these threads. And you have such a gift for needlework. I am in much awe and admiration, as I'm sure you know. I'm afraid that, though I wish to stay for a little longer, I have been charged with a few tasks that must be completed by the end of the day, so I must leave you to it. I hope the Colonel is not working you too hard, Mr. Graham. You always seem to be afoot on some task or another. I find it a great privilege that the Colonel has entrusted me with these, so it is no bother. Just as Mr. Graham is about to bow and go on with his tasks, you see another familiar figure under the shade of a tree not too far away. It is Lord Sutton, and you are surprised to see he is with Miss Peregrine. Mr. Graham notices the shift in your attention and follows your gaze. Lord Sutton and Miss Peregrine are both impeccably dressed and adorned with the perfect accompaniments. Accompaniments? <laughs> okay. He with an elegant walking stick, and she a delicate parasol. When Lord Sutton makes a comment, Miss Peregrine responds by letting loose a silver tinkling of laughter that drifts through the park. In return, Lord Sutton chuckles, the sound long and rich. Mm. <laughs> Hope they'll marry and produce a plethora of haughty, spoilt children. 
Well, I suppose I shouldn't be surprised that Lord Sutton prefers the company of such an unpleasant woman. Lord Sutton has spent a fair, his fair share of time obliging rich ladies with titles, young or old. I assure you, he is deriving pleasure from the dance of etiquette rather than from the company of his partner in question. Or, I hope that to be the case, at least. I would not wish to see him married to one who screeches at crying children. Hmm, true. You should give Lord Sutton a little more credit. He's too sharp to be taken in by anything against his will. Oh. I don't know. You're simply talking and laughing together. You are remiss to deduce matrimony from an innocent and perfectly acceptable exchange. First you talk and laugh, then you find yourself the husband of an unple unpleasant, demanding woman. Mr. Graham visibly shudders. Huh. That's interesting. There's something deeper here. <coughs> but really, I ought to take my leave. I hope to speak with you again soon, Miss Sharp. Mr. Graham bows and walks away. You can hear him muttering under his breath about Lord Sutton and Miss Peregrine, clearly displeased with the notion. Meanwhile, you return your attention to Lord Sutton and Miss Peregrine, who are now taking a stroll around the park. Miss Peregrine has a perfectly gloved hand on Lord Sutton's arm, and he appears to have no objection. They really do make quite a striking pair, and they are quite well matched in terms of their elevated positions. Perhaps Mr. Graham was right to be anxious about possible matrimony. What a thought to ponder on, but perhaps it could be left for another day. For now, you return to your task at hand. Huh. Uh, I don't remember what it is. Oh, scandal. I remember. There we go. Okay. Let's see. Okay, let's go talk about Miss Peregrine. You, Mary, and Phoebe are enjoying a spot of afternoon tea together. Phoebe seems to be a little dispirited lately, and Mary is trying to cheer her up. Phoebe, did you hear the news about Mrs. Mr. Chapel's Lending Library receiving some new stock next week? Perhaps we could go together and see if there are any volumes we would like to borrow. Oh, that would be lovely. I have just finished the second volume of Mrs. Radcliffe's latest, and I am torn between wanting to read more and starting with something else. Did you not like it? Perhaps we could borrow two, then. I could borrow one for you, if you're worried Mr. Chapel won't issue you more than you'd like. Thank you, Mary. That is very kind of you. If you feel the need to take yet another book, you can have mine too. Elizabeth, you were too kind. I think I might like that very much. Oh, but on another matter, have you both heard about the commotion that surrounded Miss Peregrine the other day? Goodness, I don't know how it slipped my mind. Mama mentioned it after dinner, but Papa would have none of the gossip about such trivial things, so I'm afraid I don't know the details. Goodness me, it was most surprising. It seems Miss Peregrine was making a trip to Mr. Mortimer's haberdashery, and on her way to her carriage, she was accidentally bumped into by Mr. Stevens' youngest son. Yes, I remember him. Quite a sensitive boy, if a little clumsy, and always so keen to help his father in the bakery. I think the poor boy was running an errand for his father at the time, tasked to fetch some ingredients, I believe, and he was covered in flour when he collided with Mrs. Per with Miss Peregrine. Oh, her dress must have been ruined. I'm sure she was quite gracious about the accident, though. Far from it, actually. Instead of brushing off the matter as a little inconvenience and reassuring the boy, Miss Peregrine caused quite a scene by admonishing him in the most unladylike way. Dear Mary, is this another one of your pranks? For I can't believe it otherwise. Oh, but you must. The street was full of people with dozens of witnesses. After a while, Mr. Stevens came out of the bakery and personally apologized for quite a while until Miss Peregrine was suitably, suitably, suitably appeased. If what you say is true, then this is such unfortunate news. Though, Elizabeth, I do recall your Mr. Graham having his reservations about Miss Peregrine. When we took that turn in the park, he seemed rather withdrawn and uncertain about Miss Peregrine's character. made him so quick to notice her flaws. I was quite shocked when I saw Miss Peregrine's reaction. I wouldn't have expected it. You were there to witness the scene, Elizabeth? Oh, why did you not tell us? Where where were you when you saw what happened? Was Miss Peregrine as awful as everyone makes her out her to be? Um, 
worse, actually, the boy had started to cry, and she paid him no heed, instead, of, instead choosing to continue to berate him in a most dreadful voice. And to think we held Miss Peregrine in such high regards, it is all quite a shame. Yes, it is indeed a shame, and to think we were so easily deceived by a few pretty hats and dresses. Oh, how it angers me. Please don't be angry, dear Mary. Let us be glad that we are surrounded by those who are good and true. We do not need a Miss Peregrine in our lives. Yes, I suppose you're right. But it is rather curious how Mr. Graham is so perceptive about Miss Peregrine. I wonder at the true nature of their acquaintance. I'm curious also, but Mr. Graham did insist upon having no previous acquaintance with Miss Peregrine. I do not take Mr. Graham for a liar, but I think some element of his past may have contributed to his insights. Ah, uh, but how well do we really know Mr. Graham? He may be wearing a soldier's guise to hide his sinister nature, and we are, all of us, perfectly deceived. Having spent a fair deal of time with Mr. Graham, I'm pleased to announce that Mr. Graham is exactly who he says he is, kind, gentle, and much too fond of sweet things. Now as for his friend, Lord Sutton, he is always so bold and forthright, I suspect he harbors no secrets whatsoever. Phoebe agrees half-heartedly. It becomes evident that her thoughts have moved elsewhere. She speaks after slight hesitation. Mary, Elizabeth, I don't wish to spoil the mood, but, well, I would like to say that Tom has been quite upsetting. Oh, why must he continue to distress you so? He always played well with us when we were children. But do not allow him to affect you, dear Phoebe. Let us forget about him for the rest of the afternoon. Why don't you tell us why you didn't like Mrs. Radcliffe's book? After a quiet sniff and a quick dab of her handkerchief, Phoebe begins to give uh, her reasons. What starts off in a watery voice soon steadies, until Phoebe is speaking with her usual authority about her beloved books. Uh, the time passes quickly, and soon you bid one another farewell. When you leave, both Mary and Phoebe seem considerably less distressed by their respective concerns. I thought that I broke Phoebe and Tom up in this game, but maybe I'm wrong. I don't remember. <clears throat> After dinner has been served, your small party splits for half an hour or so. You, Mama, and Mrs. Worthington retire to the drawing room, while Mr. Worthington and his friends remain in the dining room for some port and cigars. Ah, uh, Miss, Mrs. Sharp, Miss Sharp, it has been a while since we've had a chance to talk. How nice it is to finally do so at last. Oh yes, there's much to discuss. It seems we have had another, have had one or two new additions to Darlington, though I'm not sure if their presence is for good or ill. Oh, of whom do you speak? Well, there's Mr. Randall, who is Mr. Murray's brother-in-law, here to help with the dressmaking while Mr. Murray looks after his wife. She has been struck ill, the poor thing, and I do hope she recovers soon. Meanwhile, Mr. Randall seems pleasant enough. His craftsmanship is another matter entirely. Oh, yes, I met Mr. Randall when I went to commission a dress, and he seemed to be quite adept, but I've yet to receive my dress, so I cannot attest to his skills. Adept as he may be, I'm sure he cannot sur surpass Mr. Murray. He is quite clearly the finest dressmaker in this part of England. Yes, Darlington is very fortunate to have him. Perhaps I shall pay Mr. Murray and his wife a visit and take a basket. Oh, they would love that so. Perhaps I could join you? Of course. Would Tuesday next suit? Perfectly. It would be so nice to see Mrs. Murray again. As for the second newcomer, well, I'm sure you've heard about Miss Peregrine. I have indeed. Man, I'm getting so sick of this woman. Goodness, Mrs. Worthington, I do not like the sound of her at all. First, she causes such a commotion amongst the young ladies, and men, come to think of it, with her arrival, and then she creates such a shocking scene on the street. I confess I had thought it the very best of her at first. How could I not have, have not, no, how could I have not given her circumstances and her fine attire? But her behavior was quite despicable. I'm afraid I must agree. It is quite a shame, really, when these ladies who have so many admirers fail to provide a good example of how to be generous and compassionate. I happened to be in town when the incident occurred, and it was rather upsetting. I do hope that those who were involved are no longer distra distressed, Miss Peregrine included. But do take heart, Mrs. Sharp, in having raised a kind and sensible daughter. Aww. Thanks. I cannot make any promises, but I will certainly try to behave with as much kindness and dignity as I can. 
those words are comfort enough to me. But we can all rest assured on the matter of Miss Peregrine, at least. Colonel Watson informed me the other day that her business in Darlington is done and she'll be leaving in the next day or two. What a great deal of fuss over a single person. She seemed to have gained more attention than His Majesty and His Highness combined. But it will pass soon enough, as all things do. Indeed. Ah, uh, but I think I hear the gentleman approaching us. I hope you are in the mood for some cards, Ms. Sharp. M Mrs. Sharp. Miss Sharp. I always mess that up. Certainly. Mr. Remington and the other gentlemen join you in the drawing room, and you spend the rest of the evening drinking tea, playing cards, and enjoying the occasional spot of light conversation. I barely talked at all in that one. Ooh, errands for Mama. You're on your way into town when you see Mr. Graham. He approaches you with a joviality that seems a little forced. Miss Sharp, what a lovely surprise. My dear Mr. Graham, I hope I'm not encroaching on your privacy if I inquire about your slightly agitated manner. My agitated manner? Oh, no, Miss Sharp, I am not. Well, I don't think I am, but I am grateful for your concern. Truth be told, I have received a bit of unpleasant news, and I am not yet sure how to respond. Would you like to tell me about it? It is about my elder brother. You have a brother? Is he as charming as you are? <laughs> Certainly not. Well, I suppose there's really no way around it. It appears that my brother passed away two days ago, though I did not see word I did not receive word until this morning. Aww. Touch him lightly on the arm. Oh, smile. When I was 16, due to my brother's interference in a personal matter, I was disowned by my father and rejected by my mother. My parents passed away a year later, which was when I left for the military. Holy cow. I suppose I chose to lead a regimental life because it was the one profession that would take me miles away from a family that cared not for me. Since then, my brother and I have been strangers to each other, so I am unaffected by his passing. I am, however, a little undecided about whether to attend his funeral. Whoa. Oh boy, this is a big choice coming up. That is quite a difficult decision to make, Mr. Graham. It is. I was wondering, would you advise me on what you think I should do? Oh no, I don't know. I understand your reluctance, but I think you should attend, if only to pay your respects and carry out your final duty. I will send word about my decision then. Thank you for assisting me. Mr. Graham bows and leads you to your thoughts about his revelation. Not simply an estranged family, but an estranged family whose members have all passed away. Wow. Okay. Uh, piano forte. No, oh, okay. work. A letter. You have received a letter from Mr. Graham. Dear Miss Sharp, I have carefully considered your advice in regards to my brother's funeral, and after much debate and some distress, I have decided to attend the service. It will not be a pleasant experience, but I am fortunate enough to have a steadfast friend in Lord Sutton who will be accompanying me. I am also consoled by the knowledge that once this ordeal has passed, you, Miss Sharp, will be in Darlington upon my return. So sweet. I already look forward to when we next meet. Yours, James Graham. Alright. Well, we'll see him soon then, I'm sure. Mama wishes to speak. Uh-oh. What'd we do? what we do wrong? Elizabeth, dear, I've been lately... I have lately been wondering about Mr. Graham. I hope he is not up to any mischief. What would he be doing? Mama, Mr. Graham is attending his brother's funeral. I don't suppose much mischief can be caused on such an occasion. Oh, but you would be surprised at some stories I've heard, so shocking and disgraceful, and very much unaligned with his character. From what Mr. No Mrs. Norris has told me, Mr. Graham's father passed away years ago, and only had the two sons. With Mr. Graham's brother now gone, I suppose the inheritance now belongs to your gentleman friend. Oh, didn't think of that. I suppose that would be the case, but what is it that you really mean to say? I am only being practical, Elizabeth, dear. If Mr. Graham were set to inherit, then that would make him a very fine match for you. 
inheritance or no, he is already a fine match for me. Oh, but an inheritance would make him an infinitely finer match, my dear. Mama is a gold digger. <laughs> well then, I have said my piece. I do hope he will return soon so we can settle the matter of his inheritance. Hmm, very interesting. Very, very interesting. I don't know. I know nothing about... Okay, school children and tea and more tea. So much tea. Okay, let's do the school children one that probably will go by fast. Um, you're walking past Limpton Hall when you see the school children sitting outside appearing a little glum. Let's approach them. Tabitha, oh, Tabitha nudges the boys when she sees you, and all the children, all three children, whoops, cancel now, okay. All three children straighten their backs. Good day, Miss Sharp, I hope you are well. Hello, Miss Sharp. With a small shaky bell, oh, so cute, Miss Sharp. Hello, children, I couldn't help but don't notice you are not your usual selves. Is anything the matter? Oh, Miss Sharp, you are friends with Mr. Graham, are you not? Has he left us forever? Don't be silly, Tabby. Just because Miss Sharp is a grown-up doesn't mean she knows everything about Mr. Graham. But I've seen them take walks together. Oh, Miss Sharp, please tell us you know his whereabouts. He's missed the, th he's missed three of his usual visits. We're all getting worried, and we don't want to bother Mr. Simmons with these questions. Hmm. I'm afraid Mr. Graham has had to leave Darlington to attend some personal matters, but he will be back soon enough. But he never told us, and that's not like Mr. Graham at all. Peter nudges Colin, who instantly looks remorseful. I'm sorry, I was being impolite. Mr. Graham would not have liked it. You see, Miss Sharp, Mr. Graham would come see us twice a week and either play with us or teach us something about the world. He has been so many places and seen so many things. And he tells us the best stories. And he doesn't mind playing with mittens. Aww. I think it would please Mr. Graham to know that you have made progress with your studies. Perhaps you could surprise him when he returns, which he definitely will. Oh yes, Mr. Graham would like that indeed. We must work. We must all work extremely hard, especially you, Colin. Of course, I'll do anything for Mr. Graham. Thank you for speaking with us, Miss Sharp. We are much obliged and wish you a good day. You leave the children in far better spirits than when you found them. As you walk away, you can hear them chat excitedly about giving Mr. Graham a gift upon his return. <laughs> <laughs> ah. Okay, what now? Tea? Tea, right? Yes, and... Oh, no, okay. Um, he was in the army, yes, correct. Okay, wait, no, there was another one. Yeah, I don't... Oh, six shillings per yard, okay. Tea. You, Mary, and Phoebe are enjoying a nice afternoon together. Elizabeth, have you had word from Mr. Graham? Do you know when he'll be back? Oh, I do not know. Oh, Mary Phoebe, waiting is such a torment. <laughs> it will be over soon, dear Elizabeth. But he has gone to attend his brother's funeral. I'm sorry to suspect there's something more to it. Perhaps he means to embark on a scandalous adventure. Oh no, Mr. Graham is most assuredly at his brother's funeral. One of Mama's friends is a distant relation of the Grahams, and she has spoken about the late Mr. Graham. Is that so? Do tell us all, Phoebe. Well, there's not much to say, really. Mama only mentioned it in passing, and I did not wish to pry. What disappointment. Oh, but I do remember Mama's friend coming to dinner many years ago and telling us about a complicated situation that had arisen with a distant family member. She may have been referring to the Grahams. Undoubtedly. Do tell us more, dear Phoebe. The details are a little unclear, but from what I remember, this family had a son who was betrothed to a girl at an early age, but he refused to marry her. <gasps> oh. This son may have been our Mr. Graham, or Mr. Graham's brother, or someone else entirely. I cannot say for sure. Oh, but that is intriguing indeed. Elizabeth, do you know anything about Mr. Graham's family? Huh. Only that he was estranged with his parents and his brother played a large role in it. Refusing to marry your betrothed would account for the estrangement, especially if his parents hasn't had insisted on it. But I wonder, what was his brother's part? Perhaps his brother alerted their parents of a Mr. of Mr. Graham's refusal. That would surely drive a wedge between them, especially in light of their parents' reaction. 
Or perhaps his brother had a scandalous liaison with Mr. B Graham's betrothed, Miss Earlwood. Oh my goodness, Mary is always coming up with the crazy ideas. But then why would Mr. Graham be punished if his brother was at fault? I'm afraid that simply does not follow, Mary, dear Mary. Oh, I suppose not. How I wish we could find out the specifics. Huh. We must also remember that Mrs. Ingram's friend may have been speaking about another family entirely, and all the speculation is for naught. I admit that might be a possibility. Right. I think that is enough of Mr. Graham for now. Phoebe, have you finished fixing your hat with that lovely satin bow? Yes, but I'm not quite sure if I like it. Perhaps I should replace it with a feather, though I'm afraid Tom would be unkind about it. You spend the rest of your time together helping Phoebe decide what to do with her hat. Oh, look, I've got rainbows. Nice. I must be nearing the end of the game because I am like, like crazy town with, um, <laughs> with points. Those are colors. Okay, hold on. Let's go point me up. Okay, let's go have tea at Castridge Court. Miss Sharp, dear, I have heard about Mr. Graham's brother. I do not wish to offer him... I No, I do wish to offer him my condolences and any assistance I can. It is so terribly difficult to lose a loved one. Thank you for your kind words, Mrs. Worthington. I will pass them on to Mr. Graham when I see him next. If I am not mistaken... It, nah. Let me start that over. If I am not mistaken, you are rather fond of Mr. Graham, are you not? It must pain you to see him thus. fondness for him has become a little more than I had expected. Ah, dear Miss Sharp, it is not unusual to be caught off guard when the matters of the heart are concerned. I must say I have formed quite a good opinion about Mr. Graham from the few occasions we have spoken. He is kind. He is a kind and lively young man, and I will be sorry to see him go when the regiment leaves Darlington. I do not wish to think about such a day. I hardly miss Mr. Graham so terribly. Take heart, Miss Sharp, for he will be back among us soon enough. I feel we need more gentlemen who are like Mr. Graham. A few weeks back, when I was shopping in town, I saw him help Mrs. Norris with her purchases. I believe he even carried them all the way home for her. My gosh, he's so nice. I also hear that Colonel Watson's dogs have taken quite a liking to him, perhaps even preferring Mr. Graham to the poor Colonel. And the dogs are excellent judges of characters. They, it's true. Dogs always know. Now that you mention it, Mr. Graham does kind of remind me of a dog. He's playful, kind, and loyal. Oh, so he does. Oh dear, we are speaking of Mr. Graham as if he's left us permanently. Let us take a turn about the room and find another topic of conversation. We're taking a turn about the room. You and Mrs. Worthington speak of more pleasant subjects, such as your current embroidery project and her latest acquisition of muslin. Okay. Here we go. An unexpected color. After his period of absence, Mr. Graham calls on you rather unexpectedly. Let's go. Miss Sharp, it is so good to see you at last. I do hope you have been well. Yes, but are you well? Ooh, last few weeks have been extremely, must have been extremely taxing on you. Um, I will be much better now that you are back. No, I will be much better now that you are among us again. Welcome back, Mr. Graham. And so the extraordinary Miss Sharp speaks. Thank you. I do feel I must apologize for having gone so long and without sending word of my whereabouts. The preparations and the funeral itself only took a few days, but afterwards... Well, there were a few matters that required my attention. Quite unexpected and quite dreary, if I am to be honest, but they had to be dealt with. And what matters were those? Oh, just this and that. As I've said, those things lie in the past, and I have no intention of revisiting them. I understand you have your reservations about Sutton, but he has been indispensable over the past fortnight. He has assisted me so thoroughly with good humor and without complaint. There were days when he had taken on tasks that were my responsibility. He is a true gentleman and a true friend. I assure you I am only full of gratitude for the friendship he has given you over the years, and especially during your time of need. Again, you take me by surprise, dear Miss Sharp. 
In any case, I have returned to Darlington for good, well, at least until Colonel Watson receives orders to move the regiment elsewhere. But speaking of the good, good, the good, <laughs> good Colonel, I must go pay him a visit now. Sutton kindly took on the task of corresponding with the Colonel, so I think he knows I've returned today. You've seen me before the Colonel? I suppose you lack a proper sense of propriety then. No. But are you not residing in Birkenbridge? Would you not have seen him prior to calling on me? I confess I've come straight here instead of to my lodging. I hope you shan't tell that to the colonel. Well, I suppose I shall take my leave then. It is so very good to be back this sharp. Until next time then, and I hope it won't be so long as the last. I'm just gonna, like, finish my points. <laughs> so close. Yeah, that's it. Okay. An evening at Birkenbridge. Woo! You and Mama have been invited to another small gathering at Birkenbridge. You approach Mr. Graham, but he appears to be in deep conversation with Colonel Watson. Oops, let's leave them be. Don't be rude. You turn away and see Lord Sutton, who nods to you in approval. He then approaches you wearing a rather grim expression. I commend you for displaying a modicum of wisdom, Miss Sharp. Oh, this man. Mr. Graham and the Colonel have much to discuss, and although doing so at such a gathering is not ideal, we should leave them to their privacy. I understand. Men and women contend with a different set of daily preoccupations, and I suppose the difference is even more pronounced for men with such important duties. Quite right. But I can assure you they are not speaking of trivial matters at present. Leaving them be is the best and most appropriate course of action. <laughs> Do not be so concerned, Lord Sutton. You and I may not be fond of each other, but I do care a great deal for Mr. Graham and will respect his privacy. Ah, uh, but I will remain concerned for my dear friend. He is simply far too kind and trusting. Though I suppose it is rather telling of his regard for you that Mr. Graham has not confided in you about his circumstances. Lord Sutton, I see you are once again attempting to goad me. I assure you, you will be unsuccessful once again. Oh, you flatter yourself to think I concern myself with you at all. I am simply here for Mr. Graham. I tire of this. Excuse me. Lord Sutton has begun to walk away when he stops and turns back. But I assure you, I will continue to observe you and, my, and your behavior with my friend. This time, Lord Sutton walks away without looking back. What a jerk. After you have thanked Colonel Watson for his hospitality this evening, you and Mama head towards the door. However, just as you are about to leave, Mr. Graham approaches you, looking rather apologetic. Mrs. Sharp, Miss Sharp, ah, oh, I'm glad to have caught you before you've both left. Mr. Graham, I'm afraid I'm a little too tired to stay for much longer. Oh, hang on. Okay, sorry. Interrupted. Uh, my father called me. Okay, let's go. Yes, of course, Mrs. Sharp. You must wish to retire for the evening. Please do forgive me. But I also wish to apologize for being a little preoccupied this evening. Colonel Watson, excuse me, Colonel Watson and I do not have much of an opportunity to converse unless an appointment has been made, and I'm afraid I was a little too absorbed in our discussion. You are forgiven. After all, we cannot fault the brave gentleman whose sole task is to defend our country. Thank you for your understanding, Mrs. Sharp. Might I perhaps call on you in the morrow? I don't say why not. I know you are well acquainted with dear Elizabeth, but you and I have only spoken on occasion. Ah, yes, of course. It would be a pleasure to speak with you more, Mrs. Sharp. Then it is settled. Now we really ought to go. Mama hurries you off before you can address Mr. Graham, but when you look back at him, it becomes quite evident that words are not always needed. Okay. Mr. Graham's green eyes are invariably bright, yeah, invariably bright, and even from a distance you can see the joy that shines within them. 
His large grin grin transforms into a smaller, softer smile when he catches your gaze. A smile that bespeaks the most utmost intimacy. Almost imperceptibly, Mr. Graham dips his head in an odd that is both tender and full of promise. You leave the room, but the memory of your momentary interaction remains with you for days to come. Super close! Give me more points! Points? Oh my goodness. As a mother, you are always on the lookout for a big fish. Rank Jane Austen's bachelors in order of fortune, starting with the smallest. Okay. Um... Yes! All right! All right. I did it. Is that enough? Woohoo! I got all my levels to 100! I didn't do that last time. I think I got them to like half. A visitor. As promised, Mr. Graham calls on you and Mama. Good day, Mrs. Sharp. Miss Sharp. Ah, Mr. Graham, you have indeed kept your word. Yes, ma'am. I am quite astonished also. As a boy, I was never inclined to follow the time, only the needs of my constantly grumbling stomach. You all take a seat around the drawing room, and Bessie brings you some tea. Mr. Graham and Mama seem happy enough to continue their conversation. But I suppose your vigorous training in the army changed that? Yes, indeed. I found the first few weeks exceedingly difficult, but when my peers rose before dawn every day without complaint, I resolved to follow their example. Nowadays, I observe my pocket watch and pay hardly pay heed to my poor, neglected stomach. Except for mealtimes, of course, during which it takes full command. Oh, but what an adjustment to make. Your own mama must be very proud of you. I beg your pardon, Mr. Graham. I did not mean to be so insensitive, especially after your recent loss. Please accept my apologies and condolences. Mr. Graham shifts slightly in his seat, and you can see he's doing his best to remain a courteous guest. Thank you. There is sudden, a sudden silence in the room while both Mama and Mr. Graham search for an appropriate topic. Hmm. Let's talk about dogs. Mr. Graham, I wish to inquire about your latest conquest of the heart. The Colonel's two spaniels seem to be shifting their loyalties to you. Oh, good, he's relaxing. Woo! Alas, I think their fondness has more to do with the treats I give them than any real affection on their part. I'm sure that is not the case. You must have a certain quality about you that the Colonel's dogs find pleasing. There's a knock at the door, and Bessie enters with cakes and scones. These all look marvelous. It certainly will be difficult to keep at bay the vices of my youth. By all means, do help yourself. We are only two women living under this roof, and it is refreshing to have visitors with such an appetite. Thank you, ma'am. You are most generous. Despite his words, Mr. Graham politely takes one cake and seems satisfied with it on the present. I hope it is not terribly rude of me, Mr. Graham, but I've heard so many rumors across Darlington that I wish to dispel any measure of gossip. That is to say, I would very much like to know what exactly happened within your family. Yeah, let's go. Sorry. Mr. Graham is rather taken aback and has difficulty swallowing his mouthful of cake. He reaches for his cup of tea and takes a moment to compose himself. I thank you for your kindness and concern, Miss Sharp, and I'm sorry to discover I have been the topic of such talk in Darlington, but it is not a subject I wish to discuss, and I hope you will respect my decision. Oh, but now you have made it seem more awful and scandalous than it probably is. Come, Mr. Graham, do indulge us a little. Hmm... Uh, please remember that every family has its own unhappy truths. You have done well to suppress the rumors pertaining to our own, so let us not badger Mr. Graham about his. Elizabeth, let us not speak of such matters. Oh, goodness. Let's maybe not say that. Dear Mama, if Mr. Graham does not wish to speak of it, then please do not be so unkind as to continue insisting. Elizabeth, this is one of the times when your opinion is not required, dear. Deliberately taking out his watch. Oh, dear, I am afraid I have overstayed my visit. I really must take my leave now. Thank you, Mrs. Sharp, Miss Sharp, for being so welcoming. I hope I will see you again soon. Yes, of course. Good day, Mr. Graham. Mr. Graham bows and leaves. He appears to be quite in, to be in quite a hurry, and his demeanor is rather stiff. Mama, however, does not pay any, this any heed, and is muttering once again is muttering about once again remaining secondary to Mrs. Norris's wealth and knowledge. Huh. spend these now, can I? Nope. Okay. Well, I 
can just skip all of those things now. Here we go, time in the park. While you were enjoying a lovely afternoon in the park, you noticed a familiar figure walking your way. It is Mr. Graham, and he is approaching you with a hint of trepidation. It is so good to see you, Mr. Graham. I have not been at ease since Mama sprung her questions on you when you, we last met. Thank you for your, thank you kindly for your concern, Miss Sharp. Mr. Graham sits on the bench beside you, but seems to be gathering his thoughts before he speaks again. Miss Sharp, I have given this a fair amount of deliberation, and I think, well, I think that I shall confide in you about my family. Yes, let's find out what's going on. I would very much like to hear this, Mr. Graham. As you might have surmised, I come from a rather modest family. The Grahams have owned a small plot of land and a decent estate for several generations, but we have always lived within our means. I had a wonderful childhood and spent much of it playing with my brother. We were quite close and delighted in the games little lay bleh, in the games little boys often enjoy. As we grew older, I noticed a certain change in my brother and in my parents. They became discontent with their situation, though to this day I still do not entirely understand why. I suppose it had a little to do with the company we kept. We, I had formed a bond with Lord Sutton, and my parents took advantage of that. Looking back, I think they wished to further their standing. It, I was oblivious to their aspirations. I enjoyed dining at the late Lord Sutton's lavish estate with dear Aubrey, for he will always be Aubrey to me, first and foremost, but I also equally enjoyed soiling my clothes after a muddy afternoon of playing. But my brother was different. Perhaps the burden of being the eldest son made him exceedingly ambitious. He understood his duties, but he also wished to surpass his station. And well, this is well, this is where I will become a little reluctant, Miss Sharp. But please do forgive me, for I am only afraid of what you may think. I assure you, my good opinion of you will not change, regardless of what you might say. I am strangely reassured by your conviction. Thank you. There was a girl who lived next door to us, all the girl next door, Miss Amelia Thorpe. She and I were friends from a young age, and, well, I suppose there was a time when we were engaged. Not a formal engagement, mind you, but a betrothal arranged when we were very young. When our parents saw how much we'd enjoyed each other's company as children, they settled the matter. Her family background was similar to mine, decent, respectable, and happily modest landowners. No one ever expected it to change. When I was about 10 and Miss Thorpe a year younger, her father decided to expand his horizons and try his hand in a few investments. My father warned him against it, but Mr. Thorpe would not listen. As it turned out, luck was on their side, and within several months, our neighbors were endowed with such a wealth of a speed that still remains unimaginable to me. As for Miss Thorpe, a drastic change came upon her. She had always been very patient and gentle, but after spending time with her new, wealthier friends, I felt she became less happy in my company. She no longer wanted to play our simple games, but fawned over the lavish and expensive gifts from her father. She politely accepted my simple tokens, but I could sense her growing disdain for them. To this day, I, don't un I still don't understand why she wished to honor our betrothal. I could offer her none of the riches she desired, but then I suppose her family had enough to keep us both very comfortable. Five years after her transformation began, I felt the need to address our widening differences. I was still very fond of her, but I felt I could no longer make her happy. Saying as much, I broke our engagement. She refused to accept my decision and instead declared her intention to plan our wedding immediately. When I told her I had no intention of attending such events, she curtly reminded me Mr. Thorpe would not take kindly to such a public rebuff. Then she launched into a series of reasons why I should reconsider my so-called foolishness, ex including my including the great disappointment I would cause in my father and the emotional blow I would deliver to my mother. Her demeanor was cold, calm, and perhaps even a little calculating. At that moment, I knew for certain we were completely ill-suited, and I absolutely could not marry her. I left. Perhaps it was not befitting a gentleman to turn his back so firmly on a lady, but I did not know what else to do. And it was then, when she realized I would not be swayed, that Miss Thorpe suddenly became exceedingly undignified. When I returned to my house, I was much relieved to have made my decision. Hmm. You know what they say about a woman being slighted? Oh yes, it is not an exaggeration at all, though I cannot imagine you to behave similarly, Miss Sharp. But that was not the end of it. I confided in my brother Francis, believing he would help me explain the situation to my parents, who, as Miss Thorpe had rightly surmised, would not be happy about losing the chance to further at furthering themselves. Oh, how I was mistaken. At his years after his years at university, during which I suspected he may have lived beyond his means, my brother wanted the same as my parents. He saw an opportunity and waste he wasted no time in seizing it. Without my knowledge, Francis offered his hand in marriage to Miss Thorpe. I do not know why she accepted, perhaps to spite me. Wishing to waste no time lest she changed her mind, my brother planned to wed her the following month. 
My parents, who were furious with me for having broken the engagement, were willing to overlook my mistake due to my brother's intervention. After all, they would have the same daughter-in-law, and it mattered not to buy which son. I, on the other hand, could not stand for it. When had my entire family, once so happy and kind, become so selfish and greedy? I was angry and hurt, but above all, I felt an immense sense of loss and displacement. The lengths to which Miss Thorpe had gone to prove her point about my family was shocking enough, but seeing my dear mama and papa's unbridled joy of receiving her dowry, I had every intention to do so, but I simply could not bring myself to attend my brother's wedding. Perhaps I did not wish to give them the satisfaction of seeing me chastened. Perhaps I still held some affection for Miss Thorpe, and Aubrey, who had yet to become Lord Sutton, knew of my dilemma and invited me to his lodgings. Gracious as he was... No. Yes, gracious as he was, he too did not understand the strength of my emotions. I suspect Aubrey would have encouraged me to, my, to mend my relations with my parents, but that was before they disowned me. My father had neither courage nor conscience to tell me himself. I received a letter from his lawyer, and dear Aubrey, who values the bonds formed by family and closest friends, was furious, and Lord Aubrey Sutton has quite a temper to behold. He clearly saw their greed, while I reprimanded myself for not realizing it earlier. But I did not wish to remain idle and angry. Aubrey was happy to take me in as his own brother, and but I had learned not to rely on anyone but myself. I joined the army without having any contacts, and began making my own way. To this day, I am endlessly grateful for to having been assigned under Colonel, Watson's, bleh, Colonel Watson's command. I was honest and revealed to him my circumstances, and he gladly took me into his service. He has been very understanding and has seen similar situations before. I think he takes great pride in fostering men with these backgrounds. My parents died a few years after I left, and my brother just last month, as you know. I suspect his premature death was caused by heavy drinking. As for Mrs. Frances Graham, I can only say that widowhood does not seem to suit her. And so, there you have it. I confess I'm a little afraid you might think me a fool. Wow. That was quite the story. <laughs> Far from it. You are a good man with strong virtues, and my opinion of you has only risen as a result of this knowledge. I cannot begin to say how much your words have comforted me. Goodness me, I have spoken quite a considerable length. I hope my long tale has not tired you. And I hope you're not too distressed from recounting such painful memories. I thought I would be, but in truth, being in your presence is quite a balm. What do you say to a turn about the park? It would be such a, it would be good to stretch our legs after such a while. Yes, a walk would be lovely, Mr. Graham. You take a quiet stroll about the park and speak of lighter matters until it is time to go home. Ever the gentleman, Mr. Graham, insists on walking you to the door. Thank you for today, Miss Sharp. I look forward to seeing you soon. Likewise, Mr. Graham, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. When Mr. Graham finally leaves, he says he has become much lighter and happier. It seems you are responsible for the balance that has returned to his steps. You are walking by Mr. Stevens' bakery when you see Mr. Graham speaking to another soldier in uniform. They are conversing about what seems to be an urgent matter. As they speak, Mr. Graham glances your way and notices your present. presence. Smile. Mr. Graham almost breaks into one of his customary grins, but refrains from doing so due to his current company. His eyes, however, shine with delight. Knowing there is no possibility of speaking to Mr. Graham at present, you go on with your day. Visitor. After Mr. Graham arrives, you exchange a few smiles before you're both seated in the drawing room. Good day, Miss Sharp. I hope this is not an interruption, but I am very pleased to see you. It is an interruption, yes, but quite a pleasant one. Might I inquire about your mother? Is she well? Do you mean to ask if she yeah. do you mean to ask if she is home at present? Well, yes, I suppose. It's just that, well, truth be told, I would feel a great deal more comfortable knowing I won't be subject to another interrogation today. But who's to say you will be interrogated, this time by yours truly? I beg you, Miss Sharp, have mercy on this poor innocent man. I have told you all, and there is truly nothing more to add. At this moment, Bessie enters with some tea for you both. Would you like something to eat as well, miss? We've not got any more cakes, but scones we have a plenty. Or I could fetch something else if you'd so please. Actually, Miss Sharp, I am more than happy with just my cup of tea. Uh... I mean, 
yeah, let's have scones. Like, I'm always hungry. Oh, but that won't do. It was you yourself who confessed to being ravenous at all times. Bessie, the scones would be lovely. Thank you. Yes, miss. Really, Miss Sharp, please. Do not go to the trouble. I have just eaten. And I really do not wish to make a fuss. <clears throat> no, it will not do. I insist, Mr. Graham. And I insist more strongly, Miss Sharp. Miss Bessie, this tea is lovely and more than sufficient. Thank you ever so much. Bessie curtsies before leaving, wearing a rather stunned expression. Miss Sharp, if you are amenable to the idea, I was hoping we could enjoy each other's company today in simple silence. I have brought a book with me and, well, goodness me, I do not know what has come over me. Perhaps this is not one of my brightest ideas. Haven't we already done this like three times together? Like, we hang out all the time. This is honestly the best kind of relationship. Like, um, where you can just be, like, in each other's company. Um, my best friend, actually she's coming over today to do laundry. Um, she just comes over and we just hang, you know? We just do stuff. Like, sometimes she takes a nap at my house. <laughs> like, you know, that's the best kind of relationship is where you just, like, comfy together. And it's even better in, like, this kind of relationship where, like, he comes over and he just reads a book and then she just, like, works on her needlework and, like, yes, let's go. <clears throat> on the contrary, I think it is a marvelous idea. I believe we've done our fair share of talking over the past week or so and it would be lovely to indulge in silence for a while. You are simply splendid, Miss Sharp. Thank you. Well, I have my book and my tea. Is there anything I could fetch for you, Miss Sharp? No, thank you. I intend to continue work on my embroidery project, which is almost near completion. That sounds wonderful. Oh, but I must contain my excitement lest I become a distraction to you. You retrieve your needlework and the necessary tools and begin with your work. Although you cannot know for sure, you suspect Mr. Graham is studying you rather intently. Let's glance up at him. Mr. Graham's surprise at being caught red-handed quickly turns into a guilty grin, and then a warm and affectionate smile. He raises his book in a silent salute before settling into it. Look how cute he is. Oh my god. The time goes by rather quickly before you've noticed it's passing. Bessie knocks and announces luncheon is ready to be served. I told Mrs. Gertrude Mr. Graham has been visiting, so she is prepared enough for two. Do you wish to be served luncheon, or would you prefer to remain with your tea, Mr. Graham? Oh, I would very much like some more tea, but perhaps with a spot of lunch if that is permissible. Bessie curtsies again and leaves before returning to the drawing room with some food. It is a rather informal luncheon, and you and Mr. Graham enjoy some light conversation with your meal before he takes his leave. Thank you for a most enjoyable day, Miss Sharp, and for your hospitality. I treasure your company more than I have words to express. Let us hope many more of these such occasions will arise, and I shall see to it that they do. You have my word, dear Miss Sharp. Please be so kind as to give your mother my warmest regards. Good day, Miss Sharp. You watch Mr. Graham as he leaves and disappears from view. When you return to your house, it feels a little emptier than before. This is why I just love his storyline. He just feels so cozy. Like, he's so sweet. Ugh, sorry. I'm tired. He's so sweet and he's so kind. And he's just, you know... He is the best of the suitors, which is probably why he is the one that you have to pay for. <laughs> I mean, you have to buy the actual game, but like also the, um, his storyline is a DLC. So anyway, um, okay, so Mama wants to talk to us. Oh man, what do we do this time? You were helping Bessie in the garden when Mama corners you with a ferocity that does not bode well. Oh boy. What is it this time? <laughs> yes, Mama, what can I do for you? When Mrs. Gertrude and I were going for our supplies earlier, she kindly informed me a missing, miss, a, missing, <laughs> a missing portion was due to entertaining a certain Mr. Graham when he was here two days ago. You know we've barely enough to have both the Earlwoods and the Worthingtons over for tea this week, so why would you feed someone who is under the care of Colonel Watson and the entire British Empire to think of it? I suspect your reaction does not concern the food, but something else entirely. 
I shall get to the point then. Why did you not inform me Mr. Graham had visited? Because Mr. Graham is my friend and my pers and my personal affair. I needn't inform anyone about his visits. Well, that's not exactly... Uh... In all honesty, dear mama, it simply skipped my m slipped my mind. It wasn't my intention to keep anything from you. I'm sorry you had to hear from Mrs. Gertrude. Well, do try to remember should there be a repeat occasion. Do you think he intends to ask for your hand? I have heard Colonel Watson speak of him highly, but you can never be too careful when a lady's reputation is at stake. Um, I understand your concerns, dear mama, but I implore you to have some faith in me and in the good colonel. Mr. Grimm is good and honorable and would not wrong me. For your sake, I hope you have not been misled. Perhaps you think me foolish for being so prudent, but I cannot bear with the thought of my only daughter living with difficulty and in destitution. I would never forgive myself if Mr. Graham causes you the very unhappiness that is within my power to prevent. But perhaps I am simply growing more afraid with age. I do not know Mr. Graham well enough to trust him, but I will trust your judgment. Think no more on the luncheon, dear Elizabeth. Mama gives you a small smile, then leaves you to it. Okay, so honestly, I thought that we were like close to the end here, but maybe we're not. <laughs> so I think I'm gonna go ahead and stop the game here. Hold on. Save. Um, Elizabeth Sharp. Yes. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so um, I'm gonna stop the game here and we'll pick up next week for episode, I don't even know what episode we're on. Um, and then uh, we'll see see what happens seems like we're really coming to a close here like they're they're really dang close so <laughs> let's see what happens all right so um check out my instagram for updates of everything that's coming up in december and obviously if you're watching this video later than december then thank you for joining me and check out my instagram for whatever's happening at whatever time period this is thank you okay that is all. All right. Goodbye.